Tonight we're going to study the parable of the two debtors. So if you would turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 7. We're going to read verses 41 through 43 and just follow along with me as I read this. It's a very simple parable, but this is verses 41 through 43. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Now, as we study this parable, let me remind you that parables are allegorical in nature. That means that the people, things, or events in the parable have symbolic meaning. So if you want to get the parable right, you have to get the symbolism right. Now, the symbolism of the parable of the two debtors is very straightforward. The two debtors represent two groups of people. Notice in verse number 42 that they both had a debt that they couldn't pay. Their debt represents sin. So both groups are sinners, but one group owed a greater debt. One owed 500 pence while the other owed 50. So one owed 10 times more than what the other did. Now, because debt represents sin, that means that one group was 10 times worse when it came to sinning than the other group. In other words, they had a lot more to be forgiven of. Now, think about this. We have the tendency in this world today to group people into one of two groups. You have good people and you have bad people. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, you look at certain kids, you school teachers, and you go, oh, those are good kids. I wouldn't want my kid running around with them. And those are the bad kids. You know, you're looking at that and you're dividing it. Well, we do that with people too. Now, regardless of whether a person is good or bad, they're still a sinner. They owe a debt they can't pay. But my point is this. Even the world does what Jesus did in this parable. The world divides people into two groups, good people and bad people. Now, the creditor in this parable, of course, represents God. And the good thing is... He doesn't just forgive the debt of good sinners. In other words, those people who've sinned just a little bit. That's been what we would consider good most of their life. No. He also forgives the debt of bad sinners. Those who've sinned a lot. A whole lot. Those type of people that we would refer to as trash. And people, that's good news. But here's what's interesting. That's not what the parable is about. The parable is about the level of gratitude that a person has in proportion to how much they've been forgiven. And this is pretty obvious, when you, pretty obvious when you read the parable. It's pretty easy to pick up on. Look at verses 42 and 43 again. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose, I guess, I bet that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Now, I added those things like, I suppose, I guess, I bet. But really, that's not what that word means. Notice that he said, I suppose. Suppose is translated from the Greek word hupolambano. Now, to fully understand the meaning of this word, I really need to explain the etymology of the word, if you don't mind. Hupolambano is a compound word. Now, if you've been coming here for a while, you know what a compound word is. What is a compound word? It's a word that's been made up of more than one word. In this case, this word is made up of two words. The prefix hupo, which means under. In fact, the word hippopotamus is actually made up of this prefix hupo. It's transliterated from that Greek word. It's a horse, supposedly, that's underwater. A hippopotamus or a hupopotamus. So hupo means under or below. And then you have the root word lambano. Now, lambano originally meant to grab, to grasp. But it's normally translated in the Bible as to take or to receive. But when you grab something, you take it. Let me give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's suppose that 10 years ago when my girls, well, actually be longer than that, 15 to 20 years ago when my girls were little, let's suppose that they wanted some money from me, and I reached in my billfold, and I pulled out a $20 bill, and I held it out. Well, I would expect them to take it. And if they didn't take it, I would probably say something like this. Well, are you going to grab it or not? Now, what I'm really saying is, take it. Here, it's yours. 
That's why they normally translated lambano to take or to receive. You want them to reach out and grab it, when they, but when they grab it, they're taking it. But technically, the word lambano means to grab or to grasp. Now, when you combine the prefix hupo with the root word lambano, it literally means to grab below. Or in other words, to pick up. Because when you grab something below your waist, it's normally to pick it up. If we're walking along and there's a dollar bill on the ground and I tell you to grab that, what are you going to do? You're going to bend down and you're going to pick it up. That's what hupolambano means. And it came to mean to pick something up. But here's what's interesting. Just as we use that as a figure of speech, in Jesus' day they used this word hupolambano as a figure of speech. It literally meant to pick something up. But it didn't mean literally, it meant it figuratively. Does that make sense? So when Jesus asked Simon who will love him the most, and Simon said, I suppose... That word suppose is hupolambano. And what he was really saying was, what I'm picking up from the story is that the man who owed the greatest debt would love more. You see, that's a figure of speech. When you hear the parable, it's obvious what Jesus is implying, which means you're able to pick up what he's trying to say. So this is a figure of speech, which means the point of the story is obvious. In fact, you can probably actually sense the sarcasm, or I shouldn't say sarcasm, in a sense a little bit of an irritation because Simon was a Pharisee. This is not Simon Peter we're talking about. This is Simon the Pharisee, and he realizes this parable is being directed to him, and it's pretty obvious what it means. And so he doesn't just answer, he says, I suppose. And there's a little bit of that. In other words, I pick up what you're trying to say, Jesus. So basically, Simon knew the answer, and so do we. Because the, the answer is pretty obvious, and it's easy to pick up from the story. The one who's forgiven the most will love the most. Did everyone pick that up? Hupo Lambano. So the spiritual truth being emphasized in the parable is this. To whom much is forgiven, loves much. And to whom little is forgiven loves little. In other words, the level of gratitude a person has is in direct proportion to how much they've been forgiven. In fact, that should be written down in your Bible because that is the spiritual truth that's being illustrated. It's not coming up on the screens, but you need to write this down. So let me say it again two more times so you can write it down. The level of gratitude a person has is in direct proportion to how much they've been forgiven. Need me say it one more time? Those writing it down? The level of gratitude a person has is in direct proportion to how much they've been forgiven. And we instinctively know that that's true. Just think about it. Suppose that you and I are out somewhere and you forgot your wallet and we're thirsty and we decide to buy a pop. We're from the South and in Oklahoma it's a pop. Everyone knows what a pop is. If you say Coke... You don't mean Coca-Cola. It could be Coca-Cola, but it's any type of pop, right? So let's suppose you're thirsty and you decide that you want a pop too and you realize you don't have your bill for you. Oh, man, I don't have my bill for you. Don't worry about it. I'll buy you one and I give you a dollar. And you buy a soda pop. And what do you tell me? You tell me, well, I'll pay you back tomorrow. And tomorrow comes and guess what? You don't have the dollar. Now, if you know me, I don't really care about the dollar, but I want to kind of gig you, so I'd say, you got my dollar? And, oh, I forgot my billfold again. I'm sorry, I don't have it. Ah, you don't need to pay me, it's just a dollar. Now, let me ask you that. If I tell you you don't need to pay me, it's just a dollar, are you going to send me a thank you card? No. Do you feel indebted to me for life? No. But let's suppose that someone else comes and for some reason maybe I've fallen in some money, maybe I've inherited it, and they want to borrow $100,000 to build a home. And I, for some reason, I'm out of my mind, I do it. <laughs> and I loan them $100,000 and they build this home but they lose their job and then they're unable to pay me. So they come to me and they say, I can't pay you back, Pastor Allen. I'm so sorry. And, you know, I hurt my back and I can no longer work. And now I'm on disability. So I'm never going to be able to pay you back. And I tell them, forget about it. You don't owe me a thing. Now, who's going to be more grateful? You 
who I loaned the dollar to to get a soda pop, but I forgave the debt, or the person I loaned $100,000 to and forgave the debt. Well, that's a no-brainer. Now, according to this parable, there are two groups of people in this world. you got the good people and the bad people. You have those that have a lot to be forgiven of and those who have little to be forgiven of. Now, who's going to be the most grateful? That's a no-brainer. If you're Simon, you would say, well, I suppose. In other words, I pick up from the story the one who has a lot to be forgiven of. So, what's the spiritual principle being taught in this parable? Here it is. To whom much is forgiven, loves much. To whom little is forgiven, loves little. Would we all agree with that? Because I'm going to make some different spiritual application here because Jesus is going to make some different spiritual application. But we need to understand the spiritual truth is being illustrated. Does everyone get that? To whom much is forgiven loves much. To whom little is forgiven loves little. So let's apply the spiritual truth. According to this parable of those forgiven, who loves Jesus the most? Is it those who are not raised in church? And those who have committed all types of horrible sin and then they were saved later in life? Are they the ones that are going to love Jesus the most? According to this parable? Yeah. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's the ones that have really done horrible things. Murder, rape, getting people hooked on drugs, embezzling, stealing, burglarizing, all of these horrible things. And then they get saved? They've got all of these things to be forgiven. Wouldn't they be the ones that love Jesus the most? Now be Simon. I suppose, right? Okay, so according to this parable, who loves Jesus the least? Is it the good, what we consider good, moral people who've been raised in church and saved in an early age and they've never really ever done anything what we would consider to be bad? Alcohols never touch their lips. They feel bad even if they imply a lie and they've got to come clean. They're the ones that have never done anything in their life that we would consider to be wrong. Will they love Jesus the least according to this parable? Yeah, Simon, I suppose, yes. Why? Because they have the least to be forgiven of. Now, is that what Jesus was teaching in this parable? No, that doesn't sound right, does it? You see, Jesus describes the debt of sin not objectively as it really is, but subjectively. In other words, by how it's perceived. You see, most of us never perceive our debt to be as great as it really is. And people, that was Simon's problem. Simon was self-righteous. What we didn't read is that Simon is a Pharisee. In fact, if we went back and we read the verses preceding this parable, we would find out the context of the story. Jesus is doing all of these great miracles. He's out among the people. And even the Pharisees are really just excited to be around him. They might not be accepting him, but you've got to admit, the guy's got charisma. And the guy's doing wonderful miracles. And I mean, the guy just has a knack to be able to understand the Bible or the Old Testament for that time. And so even they were excited to be around him. So this Pharisee invites Jesus over for dinner. And of course, when you invite Jesus, you've got these 12 men ragtagging alone. So you've got to invite them. And then you've got the other people that are coming. And so the Pharisee wants to make sure that his friends come too. So you've got this whole group that's there. And if you understand the way they live, most houses, if you had enough money, you had this courtyard. And it was really open to the public. And so with all of these people, you would want to eat outside, which also means the public would be coming in and out. And while they're there eating, this woman comes in, and this woman is of ill repute. I mean, this woman is a prostitute. This is a person that does horrible things. And when she comes in, she begins to wash Jesus' feet. And Simon the Pharisee thinks to himself, not Simon Peter, Simon the Pharisee. He thinks to himself, well, if he was really the Messiah, if he was really a prophet, he would know what type of woman this is. And Pharisees believed that sin could actually be transmitted, transmitted through touch. 
In fact, that's why they didn't like to be around these type of people. They didn't even want to touch them. And, and Simon's thinking, if he's really a prophet, he would know what type of woman this is, and he would command her to stop and wouldn't allow him to touch her. And Jesus realizes that Simon's thinking this. In fact, I like to think it's a word of knowledge, but probably in reality, he's looking at Simon, and it's all over Simon's face. So Jesus tells this parable. And that's why Simon says, I suppose. No, he picked up from the story, Hoople Lambano. He knew what the point was. But you need to understand something. There's a deeper truth here. The problem is Simon did not perceive himself to be a sinner. He, he realized that, yes, there's this, this concept of original sin. Yes, everyone does things wrong. That's why God implemented the Mosaic sacrificial system. He's thinking that. You know, everyone, every once in a while, has to take the sacrifice for sin. But let's be honest. I keep the letter of the law. Compared to everyone else, I'm a good person. Now, doing that... He's the one that doesn't perceive it. So what Jesus is teaching here is not who much has been forgiven loves much and whom little is forgiven loves little. No, Jesus is not teaching that. Well, pastor, I thought you said he was. Well, let me add one word. Here's what Jesus was really teaching. He was teaching that the person who perceives he's been forgiven much loves much. And the one who perceives he's been forgiven little, loves little. That's deeper. See, he's looking at Simon, who's a Pharisee, who keeps the letter of the law. Who's probably prosperous because they taught that godliness and prosperity are one and the same. And as a result of that, he has everything that he wants, everything that he needs, but he believes he's righteous. And so when Jesus tells this, what he's trying to tell him is, it's not being said objectively, it's being used subjectively. The person who perceives he's been forgiven much, loves much. And the one who perceives he's been forgiven little, loves little. You know, it's kind of funny. And, it, and really, it's based on a true supposition. Most of us have been taught, because we grew up Baptist, that all sin is the same. How many have been taught that? That's a fallacy. It's not true. Not true at all. The reason we believe that is because we have faulty logic. The Bible tells us that all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. And all sin separates us from God. Therefore, all sin must be the same. Well, that's faulty logic. Not all sin is the same. In fact, the Bible has five different words for sin. Each of them refers to a different type of sin. The Bible even tells us in the Old Testament that certain sins deserve certain types of punishment. There are certain sins that were worthy of capital punishment. You stoned them. You killed them for that sin. So the Bible doesn't teach that all sin is the same. It doesn't do that at all. But as a result of that, and we intuitively know that, we know that telling a little white lie is not the same as murder. We know that looking at someone else's test just for one answer is not nearly as bad as raping or getting someone hooked on drugs. We know that, right? But as a result of that, we have the tendency to go, well, at least I don't do that. And so what happens is we perceive ourselves to be good. But there's a problem with this. If the truth be known... Most of us are as sinful as those who were destroyed in the city of so cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We just don't know it. And what was the sin of the inhabitants of Sodom? Does anyone know? You know, it's not a trick question. What was the sin of those in Sodom? Why were they destroyed? Yeah. Homosexuality, right? Yeah. In fact, our English word sodomy which means sexual perversion or abnormal sexual intercourse, was actually derived from the word Sodom. It comes from the Bible. So when we hear the word Sodom, we think bad people, perverts. And they were. But let's find out what their specific sins were. 
Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse number 49, because the prophet Ezekiel tells us what their specific sins were. And here's what's interesting. He emphasizes the things that good people do more than he does the things that bad people do. And it's kind of a shock. Notice what it says. Sodom's sins were pride, he's being specific, gluttony, and laziness. While the poor and the needy suffered outside her door. She was proud, and then notice this, and committed detestable sins. You know, you have some scholars go, well, you know, really homosexuality wasn't. Yes, it was. That's what detestable sins are. So I wiped her out, as you have seen. Now, it's true, as I said, they did detestable things like homosexuality. But notice the other sins. Pride. I hate this one. Gluttony. Laziness. And a lack of compassion for those who are less fortunate than us. And according to Ezekiel, those are bad sins. Enough to be specifically pointed out. But the truth is most, pe- most good people are guilty of these sins. We don't just think of, but the problem is we don't think of those sins as being bad. Simon didn't. That's why Simon looked at this woman who was coming, who was truly repentant. And she was touching Jesus. She was washing his feet. And here's what's interesting. After the parable, Jesus begins to go into a little bit more detail. And he says, Simon, I came to your house and you didn't anoint my head. And that was a custom that they would have done. You didn't wash my feet or even have one of your servants wash my feet. You didn't even treat me like a respected guest. Well, I've been here. This woman has come and she's washed my feet with her tears. And she's wiped my feet with her hair. And you want to know why? Because she knows she's a sinner. And though you might admit if someone pushes you that you sinned, you don't see yourself as a sinner. You see, Simon perceived himself as a good person with little to be forgiven of. And Jesus, get this, picked up on that. Hoople and Bano. And that's why he told this parable. So what we really bring out of this parable or what we should be picking up from this parable is how do we perceive ourselves? Do we perceive, of ourse- perceive ourselves as a good person who has little to be forgiven of when we got saved? Or that we were a bad person who had a lot to be forgiven of when we were saved? You see, the way you perceive your former self, and the reason I say your former self is, yes, we still sin after we're saved, but there's a big difference. I'm going to be teaching this this Sunday. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. When Jesus comes in and saves us and he becomes Lord of life, there's a change. We still might be rough around the edges. We still might do things we shouldn't do. We still might struggle with the same things we struggled with before we got saved. But there's a big difference. Now we're convicted of that. Now there's a desire to live for God. Now there's a desire not to do the things that we've done. And that's why we struggle. But you see, if we really were a pretty good person before we got saved, we really don't struggle with much, or at least in our mind. We really don't think that Jesus really had to pay for too many sins for us. And as a result of that, we don't have the gratitude that we should have for Jesus. We don't see what we're really like, or what we were like before Jesus came in and saved us. And so the gratitude's not there. But I tell you, I think the the thing that was most uh, I want to say horrible when Jesus came is that Simon didn't respect who Jesus was because of the way he perceived himself. And sometimes we're like that. We don't really respect who Jesus is or what he's done for us because of the way we perceive ourselves. We know that he died for our sins, but we really don't look at it like it was that big a deal. Because after all, I was in this group of good people. I wasn't bad like them. Not realizing that what's in our heart, 
We might not have done it outwardly, but we did some really horrible things inwardly. And Jesus died for those too. And if we don't have a gratitude towards God, it will affect our love towards God. You know, sometimes when I come in my prayer time and I'm sitting down and I'm really thinking about who God is because I, I really follow the outline that Jesus gave his disciples to pray. So I'm hallowing the name of God. I'm appropriating who he is. And I get to that part of, of who he is, Jehovah, to seek anew my righteousness. And I think about the reason I'm righteous is because I was joined to Jesus. He became my sin. He became who I am. And I start thinking about all the things that he died for. And it might not have been things that I did, but it had to do with things of the heart. And I start thinking about how egotistical I am, how prideful I am. I get to thinking about all the horrible things I thought that maybe was never manifested but was always there. And I begin to realize what Jesus had to do to pay for my sins. And then I realize, even now, what a horrible person I am. And let me tell you, my attitude towards Jesus changes immensely. My gratitude and my love for what he's done is unbelievable. Now, if you're a parent, you can really relate to this. Because what you deal with when your children are little deals more with their heart than it does their actions. And you realize that the actions are just a manifestation of the heart. But sometimes you have that child that won't really manifest it, but you can tell in their heart, they just don't want to share. They're selfish, they're prideful, they're stubborn, they're rebellious. And they might not do these other things that kids do. But when you get to that point, you start looking at their heart and you go, you know, I don't want their heart to be like that. That's God. That's God. God is just as concerned with our heart as he is what comes out of our heart. And if you actually go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, that's what Jesus was dealing with.